Good evening and welcome to Montgomery County Council Vice President Tom Hooker's COVID-19 virtual town hall. Uh, we are going to get started now. I do want to introduce myself. My name is Julio Murillo, Deputy Chief of Staff for Tom, and I will help moderate uh, this conversation today. Before we begin, I do want to share with you all that we have a tremendous and overwhelming amount of people who uh, showed interest in the in this town hall today. So we're going to have a lot of questions. So if we do not get to your question today during the town hall, please uh, still contact us and submit your questions, include them in the Q&A uh, box. And we promise that we will get back to you with an answer. So, or you can also call uh, our office and leave a voicemail and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Uh, so with that short introduction, now I'll turn it over to Council Vice President Tom Hucker. Thanks, Julio. And thanks to you and Dave uh, for setting all this up and everybody that's tuned in. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, the, as you all know, the ongoing COVID uh, emergency has affected our ways of life in, in tremendous, um, tremendous ways that we wouldn't have even anticipated just even a few months ago. Our everyday, we're all, you know, some of us are learning to work from home more efficiently. Others are on the front lines as essential workers. Um, we're all doing our best to get through this crisis. Um, that's affecting so many of our residents in just profound ways. Many of us have had friends or family members directly affected. Um, and while these uncertain times are really difficult for everybody, um, they pose an especially acute challenge for our seniors, for our uh, 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 families experiencing homelessness, um, for our disabled, for folks who have pre-existing conditions, and for many other uh, uh, po vulnerable populations. And so last week, if you tuned in, we were very focused on the school system and their efforts to stand up the distance learning. This week, we have some health experts with us, and we're really looking forward to, to doing a deep dive into how the county is addressing the public health emergency and um, hearing from you about what you think we could do better. So um, I'm really pleased that we have uh, terrific experts in, the, in those fields with us tonight. I, I do want to say at the beginning, I've heard from so many constituents in the past few weeks. Some have faced housing uncertainty as the crisis continues and the rent comes due. Some have uh, need assistance with unemployment benefits or have faced loss of income or food insecurity. Others are, are dealing with stress and anxiety and isolation. And with the emergency now entering its fifth week, we're sort of in a different phase. Um, I want to ensure that members of the community know um, that we have a lot of resources out there to make things better for them. Um, and to get in touch with us to help them access those resources. This is a caring community. We need to go to be patient with each other and kind. We're all dealing with an, an emergency we've never uh, lived through before. And uh, I know though that, th that this is Montgomery County and we're gonna get, get through this together. Um, before we jump into the program, I do wanna provide a brief update on just my work over the last week. Um, um, I've hosted six webinars reaching over 700 businesses with information apply about applying for county and state and federal relief programs for our businesses that are, are hurting. It's such a, um, during this, this, what we think will be a historic recession. I also have been working closely with the county executive and his top staff um, and leaders in the business community to set criteria for how that funding will be dispersed now that the, now that the council has passed um, the funding has passed the, the funding program. The county council, in particular, uh, council members Reamer and Albernoz, um, my colleagues worked closely with uh, our health officers to implement some new regulations requiring masks in our grocery stores and our retail stores to protect the public, which is terrific. Um, and those went into effect, you all know, today. And tomorrow at our council meeting, Councilwoman Navarro and Albernoz and I will be introducing $5 million in additional uh, relief funds for our retail businesses and our restaurants that have been hit so hard in this recession because of the, the unique requirements of social distancing during this recession um, and, and because of the limitations in the governor's executive order. Um, third, I organized a letter signed by the county executive and most of my colleagues to ask the governor to release $500 million in the rainy day funds for, to reinvigorate our economy. Uh, we, we have done a good job of saving money at the state level. Um, this is the rainy day we've been waiting for and uh, anticipating, and this is the right time to spend that money to reinvigorate our economy and get things restarted as soon as it's safe. Um, 
we have not, um, uh, we certainly have limited funds at the county level. We can't save the Montgomery County economy and, 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 and uh, restart it just by ourselves. We really need help from our state and federal partners. And that's what that letter is intended to do to support Comptroller Peter Francho um, and others who have called for the governor to release those funds from the rainy day fund. And then finally, I joined my colleagues asking, um, and there were about 80 state legislators that signed a separate letter uh, led by uh, Delegate Nick Mosby. We all called on Governor Hogan to release the data on the racial disparities um, uh, regarding uh, the COVID-19 cases. And we're now going through the initial data to, to look at uh, the, the um, uh, to analyze them and to, um, uh, to change our, our um, uh, response to make sure that we're uh, responsive to that data. There are limitations to how the data were released. Um, you uh, may have seen some of the media coverage of this. Um, unfortunately, some of the highest uh, numbers of cases are in Silver Spring in my district and Councilwoman Navarro's district and zip codes 20904, 20906, 20902. We're gonna talk about that tonight, what that means and what that doesn't mean. Um, and uh, let me stop there, but I really want to thank everybody for joining us this evening, and you should know that my staff and I are here to answer all your questions during the, tonight's town hall and afterwards. We've handled hundreds of individual requests after each of our town halls. This is the third one. We'll do another one next week, and we're here for you, and please get in touch with us if we're not able to take your question tonight. Um, if we can help you access government services or government grants or one of our nonprofit partners, get in touch with us. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm really excited that we have uh, some of our busiest and uh, more most expert county leaders with us tonight to talk about the public health response. The first is County Executive Mark Elridge is with us. We have the chairman of the Montgomery County Council HHS Health and Human Services Committee. My colleague and friend Gabe Albernaz is with us as well. We have Montgomery County um, commander of our um, third police district, Darren Frank, is with us again. And, um, and then after 7.30, we have a whole pan expert panel that I'll introduce then, um, representing many of our agencies and county partners um, that are dealing with some of our, our uh, most vulnerable populations. So with that, let me stop there and see, is the county executive on the line? Okay, how about uh, the chick? How about uh, uh, Council Member Albernaz? I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Very good. There you are, Gabe. You're handsome. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, please jump in and give us a quick update on, uh, on, on what the council's been doing and the county's been doing. You're in touch with all our nonprofit partners as well. Please catch us up. Thank you, Councilmember Hucker. And if the county executive is able to join us, I'm happy to defer to him because I know he's very busy. But um, I'm giving the same disclaimer whenever doing a Zoom call. I have four children under the age of 12. So if you hear any screaming or rambunctiousness in the background, I promise you everybody is okay. Um, and I wanna thank you, Councilmember Hucker, for your leadership. Your team has really stepped up as so many of our colleagues have over the last couple of months as, as we've un addressed this really unprecedented crisis. And we're just now obviously focused on primarily uh, the immediate response and everything that's transpired over the last couple of months and what will be transpiring over the next month as we prepare for the surge, but the council is still very much uh, looking forward and thinking through the long-term ramifications of this. And on Tuesday, uh, we will get our first initial briefing on the projected revenues and their impact, which will obviously greatly impact the budgeting process going into next year. I'll just spend a few minutes uh, talking about our efforts within the Health and Human Services Committee. And I'm joined on that committee by my colleagues, Evan Glass and Councilmember Craig Rice as well. And starting about a month ago, uh, led by uh, our council central staff member, Linda McMillan, who is incredible, uh, we've had meetings every three days uh, with the leadership from the Department of Health and Human Services to see what we can do and cast a wide net as possible and make it as tight as possible to address issues as they've been emerging over the last month. And it is some days overwhelming. Um, we know that our community-based organizations and nonprofit organizations have had to step up in a very significant way to enhance their services to meet the needs of their clients. The county has significantly expanded its operation 
uh, reaching out to our homeless population, trying to divert as many of them to be able to spread out so that we have as few a concentration of people as possible. We've also uh, been doing what we can to support the incredible work going by the, uh, uh, ongoing by the Food Council, uh, addressing food security issues. And we've all been dealing with just heartbreaking and complex and difficult constituent issues as they've arisen. Um, I'll focus on three buckets for my brief presentation this morning. The first to describe the county's efforts to prepare for the surge and how the council has supported those efforts. The second to talk a little bit about this $5 million direct cash family assistance program, uh, which I'm the most familiar with and we've been the point on behalf of the council working with the executive branch on developing that framework. And then finally, talk a little bit more as I complete this, uh, talking about our community-based organizations and that social safety network. But um, the council has been working through Dr. Earl Stoddard and Dr. Gales uh, to support our hospital infrastructure so that they can be prepared for the surge, which, pe which people are now anticipating uh, will arrive somewhere in the next two to six weeks. And so the council appropriated $10 million to increase the bed capacity, but also to increase the personnel and give our local hospitals the flexibility to be able to make necessary expenditures. The great news for Montgomery County is before all of this happened, our six hospitals had formed a nonprofit organization called Nexus Montgomery, and we're already collaborating very strongly in a, in a variety of key areas. And so they were able to leverage those partnerships to expand the base. And I'm also happy to report that NIH and Walter Reed uh, have also been important partners in those discussions so that there, our county can uniquely be prepared uh, to address the surge. And so we're working collaboratively with our hospitals on that effort. We're also working closely with our clinics and doing, pushing every button we have at our disposal to increase testing capacity, which remains a critical issue across the entire country, and one that we are doing everything imaginable to try and increase, because it's the only way uh, that we will begin to really wrap our arms around this in a way that's effective, as if the testing um, is such that we're not just testing people whom we fear are sick, but also testing the people who are working on the front lines to support our most vulnerable residents. But that's the, the one bucket I wanna mention. The second is this $5 million. Um, uniquely in our region, Montgomery County has stepped up acknowledging that we have thousands, and I mean thousands of county residents who are not going to be able to access the $1,200 or any state funding that's been made available whether it's because of immigration status, whether it's because people have made below the threshold to have to file taxes for several years, um, the county executive and the council have been working collaboratively to make available $5 million, 3.5 of which will be administered by our Department of Health and Human Services, and 1.5 will be administered through our community-based organizations and nonprofit sector. We know that there are a number of families who have been disconnecting from government services over the last three years because of this administration. But we understand that not only is it morally the right thing to do to support these families, but it's imperative for our entire public health that we engage these families and make sure that they are addressing their needs and that of their loved ones. And so the $5 million is being worked out literally as we speak. We saw a first draft this past week, which my colleagues and I have commented on, and we do expect as early as the very beginning of next week that through the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as our nonprofit providers, that local families who desperately need assistance will begin receiving it as early as next week. And so that is something we're pushing full speed ahead on. And I really do wanna give credit to County Executive Elrich and his team um, for making this as high a priority as it's been and working collaboratively to ensure that this is implemented justly and efficiently. And then finally, um, we have been doing our best to address the needs of the nonprofit providers who lack PPE, um, who have major concerns with regards to their budgets, uh, big events that have been canceled over the last few months that these organizations significantly rely upon for their operating budgets, trying to 
struggle to make their payroll in the midst of all of this. And they are absolutely such a key partner in the county's efforts to expand our reach and to ensure that we have the strongest possible social safety net. And we're working our best to shore up their needs. The council did appropriate an additional million dollars to support those organizations. And my colleague, Councilmember Navarro and I are engaging the philanthropic community to try and leverage private foundation dollars with county dollars so we can expand our reach. So that's not ready yet for prime time, uh, but we are very much focusing and working on those efforts. And so um, there is uh, an overwhelming sense of the community coming together to address the very critical issues. Um, but as we all know, while we're in the midst of this immediate crisis before us, we're going to have to stick together long after this to fully address the needs of our community. Councilmember Hucker, thank you again for your leadership and that of your team. And I look forward to hearing the other presentations and trying to answer any questions that our public may have. Thank you. I've been joined by my son, Will, apparently. But hey, Will. Uh, Gabe, let me, uh, please, thank you. Thank, let me thank you for your leadership. You're being very modest, but that the $5 million and the additional million didn't happen by itself. It happened because you are so in such close touch with our HHS department and our nonprofit partners. You identified the need, you advocated for it. You were able to get our colleagues to vote for it unanimously, even though there's a lot of uncertainty about the budget and um, it wouldn't be happening without you. So I'm really grateful. And I know you have your finger on the pulse and I'm gonna defer to you if you think there's additional needs out there, um, we're all committed to fund it, I think. So um, thank you again and thank you for your availability tonight. I know the county executive uh, is, uh, is with us and is linked up. Um, Mark, are you with us yet? Okay, let me, um, he's, he's linking up. Let me uh, go to Dr. Bridgers. We're so glad that you could join us. Dr. James Bridgers, our Deputy Health Officer. Good afternoon, Council Member uh, Hucker, uh, Council Member HHS Chair uh, Albernos. Um, I know the County Executive uh, is going to join us momentarily, but thank you again for inviting me. Dr. Gales, uh, who does many of these um, um, town hall meetings and will be presenting to the council and the board of health tomorrow. We'll provide more details regarding what we're doing to combat COVID-19 and the spread in Montgomery County. But I wanted to give you some quick updates as I've done the last week and then just kind of touch on four points uh, since we last met last week. So at a glance, we have 8,936 cases, confirmed cases in Maryland. Um, in Montgomery County, we have 1,756 confirmed cases and 48 deaths. And so I know that much of the work that we've done over the last week focused principally on four things. Um, Council Member Hucker, you alluded to the zip code challenges we've been having in analyzing data. Uh, Council Member Albernos, you talked about the surge planning. Uh, but in addition to that, we've looked at the health care, um, the health officers audit that just came out. We've also looked at strengthening our capabilities to respond to needs in our long term care and assisted living facilities. And so one of the reasons in concert and meeting with the county's leadership, Dr. Gales and other planners at the state and local level, as we continue to see the increase of cases in not only the state and in the county, thought about ways to increase and safeguard and protect our community. So he issued the health order, which directs individuals to um, wear face coverings versus face masks. They're synonymous. However, a face mask has a different connotation in that we try to reserve those face masks for our much needed healthcare professionals and our uh, first responders. So if you use a face covering, you can be creative, but the whole point is to cover your face from spread, spreading any other disease if you are asymptomatic or if you have a sneeze or a cough so the droplets uh, won't uh, uh, be transmitted. There's also a need to um, look at limited spacings and we talk about social distancing and when you get into grocery stores and other um, retail uh, establishment uh, that tends to lessen 
And so Dr. Gales, in concert with the leadership and with Maryland Department of Health, uh, issued his order to put in more uh, safeguards and protective measures. They may change and or increase to expand based on these as we look at data trends, which is the second point. Uh, data was released uh, uh, Sunday, I believe, and although the zip code data identify three principal zip codes in Silver Spring, we're looking at the data and the use, and we've had com conversations with uh, yourself and other decision makers to look at creating structural systems that provide better healthcare practice in all communities. So we just, just don't want to focus on the data as being presented. We are working with our EPI team. Uh, we worked with them today and beginning yesterday when the data was released to look at uh, different ways to look at racial disparities and locations so that folks won't get a false sense of whether or not it's in my community or in my backyard. I personally live in one of those zones that's impacted by the national data. And immediately I had uh, uh, the uh, state data, immediately I had questions about does it impact me? What should I do? And we continue to reinforce and, and, and strengthen that education to social distancing, hand washing, and wearing face covering to present the spread. Stay at home, only travel for those essential uh, items that you may need. And then the third point would be our long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities. We know that there have been increased cases in those areas, we've developed uh, strike teams within uh, our public health services where we have clinical staff who are actually going there. Uh, I believe that Dr. Gales went to one this afternoon. If he didn't, uh, I know that our team went out to look and visit those facilities. We have received additional uh, personal protective posture and equipment for our long-term care and our health care uh, professionals. And so we've been, um, pushing those out and distributing them as needed. And then the final point, uh, since we last met, I think I shared that we visited the uh, Washington Adventist Hospital, uh, Tacoma Park uh, site as a possible surge um, area uh, uh, um, um, facility. We've also looked at last Friday, we went out to the county fairground with the Corps of Engineers and folks from the Maryland Department of Health to look at that as a possible uh, surge staging event. And then we are, uh, we've increased our um, mobile testing at our beep sites that I'm sure um, uh, Dr. Gales will go into more detail. We started off with 25 tests uh, being available last Tuesday. We ramped it up to 50. His goal is to do 100, but there's a mechanism in place based on scheduling. So we're looking at um, additional ways to increase um, tests and to test in those areas that may not have access to care. And so all of these things we're doing to um, stem the spread of COVID-19 in the county. I'll stop there. If there are any questions, I can respond accordingly. All right. Uh, we can take two questions before we uh, move on to the <clears throat> executive. I'll recognize uh, Chris Pulliam with the first question. Chris? Hello, Chris, are you ready? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Okay, I apologize. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I was at the supermarket this afternoon and I was very pleased to see that the vast majority of shoppers were using face coverings. Um, however, I only happened to stumble on word of the new law uh, over Twitter this weekend, and I'm wondering what the county is doing to get the word out to its residents in the hopes that we can actually get to 100% compliance on these new laws and, and protect our, uh, our grocery workers. Thank you. Well, Chris, I'll jump in and respond from what we're doing in public health services. What we've done is we've looked at our database for all of our um, um, food service and chain stores to send out a blast email to them advising them and, and, and sharing the uh, health officer's order. We also have it posted on uh, HHS's website and it's posted on 
um, the county's website as well. We are increasing our social media and we have our licensure and regulatory uh, staff going out to uh, various um, food service establishment and chain stores, uh, sharing education material, updating them, helping support, looking at social distancing, ensuring that folks are wearing face covers. And so those are some of the strategies that we have in place. They will change as we go out and when we evaluate the process or so additional information. So I encourage you to check those websites that we have for any future updates. Great, and then uh, one more question before we uh, move on to County Executive Elrich, this time from Karen Matson. Hey, can you hear me? We can. Okay, a um, couple questions really. Um, we heard at one point that the governor was using a model that showed that the, the peak for the state could come around um, April 28th. I'm wondering if um, you know the county knows more about that and uh, when we should anticipate the absolute worst. And uh, my second question is, does the county have a plan for reopening when able we when we're able to do so? Sure, great question. I will address the uh, surge planning that we're doing in HHS and public health. Uh, we've used a couple of models, not only uh, at the state, we've used uh, models at Johns Hopkins and the University of Pennsylvania, our uh, team of epidemiologists and graduate students from the area universities are looking at the modeling um, over the next two to six weeks. Um, as we get closer to a more accurate number based on the client count, we will share with the public as part of that uh, information process. So those are the modeling strategies that we have in place as I currently share that information with you this evening. And I guess I can answer the question about reopening. Um, Reopening is going to be a fluid thing because it depends on the conditions under which under which we reopen. If the governor will announce an end to the emergency, that would be the trigger, I think, for reopening. But we still maintain we still may maintain some practices going forward in order to um, just be effective in in reopening. And I guess you know my concerns are. There may still be a continuing need for social distance. Um, we have done an awful lot of telework more than anybody ever imagined. And it has opened up the door that we might well retain more teleworking in order to prevent, you know, the densities of workplaces that we have right now, or at least we had before this all started. But I think our intention is to get running as soon as we can get running. We've tried very hard to maintain as many of the normal services that we can maintain, particularly those that don't require face-to-face um, -face personal contact. So I, I guess I view the situation fluidly and it will depend on the conditions that we actually are talking about when they decide that it's time to start reopening. I think everybody's anxious to reopen. Uh, great, and I think that's a great lead-in um, to your remarks, County Executive. The floor is yours. So, um, this has certainly been an interesting time. And uh, the first thing I want to do is thank all the people in the county government who have continued really diligently to um, maintain as much of our services as we can possibly maintain. Um, there are a lot of people, you know, still coming to work. There's an astounding number of people who are teleworking. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, most of the job that we need to get done, uh, we're able to get done. We've got our first responders, and you know, I include in that the people who respond to child protective cases and adult protective services cases. They're very much on the front lines. They're very much the folks who are most exposed, our bus drivers who you know, are out there every day carrying people around. Um, they are really to be thanked for the work they've put in um, and their commitment to making sure the county 
keeps running. I also look outside, you know, the county's walls and think about all those health professionals, the people in the clinics, in the hospitals, in the nursing homes, um, who are caring for people under really, really difficult circumstances and putting um, their own health in jeopardy often to do that. And in the beginning, when supplies were insanely short, um, they really, really had had themselves in a difficult place. We have begun um, in the hospitals, I think, have greatly improved their supplies. Uh, we're trying to stay ahead of the train. Um, it's just a, it's a lot of people doing a lot of amazing work. I'm glad that, uh, you know, we were able to keep the restaurants open on a limited basis and that the, we were able to flex some of the liquor laws in order to allow, you know, some revenue boosts to the residents to the restaurants. Um, there are a lot of other folks who are shut down. And I really, you know, feel for them because that's, uh, it cuts right to their, their incomes. Uh, I have, um, I've been trying to push people toward federal programs because the federal programs are larger than the county's program and our county program can help, but federal programs are likely to help a lot more. The county's $20 million, um, the regs, I mean, the application should go up formally tomorrow, assuming that the IT people get it all translated and they can validate that it's working right. Um, we're gonna get out um, money as quickly as we can. Uh, folks will request um, how much they need and we will immediately just process the checks from 10,000 and below and even to the people who asked for more than 10 and then those will be immediately evaluated um, to make sure that they, we get the additional funds out. Um, if, if that all happens, we serve about a thousand small businesses, which I think people know is a fraction of the number of small businesses in the county. And some people may have been able to consult and do their work from home. But if you're in the retail end of the world, just like the restaurant end, end of the world, you're either open or you're not. And if you're not, you're not collecting revenue. I don't think anybody had um, catalog sales set up and ready to go in the absence of being, being able to open. Um, but we're managing this. We're working closely with the state. I will say that the governor has been very cooperative. Um, we actually have you've had really good conversations with his staff about what kind of needs we have. The one I think huge outstanding need is that we've got a segment of our population that Montgomery County is not the only county that has a large undocumented immigrant population. Um, they pay rent, they had jobs up till when they lost their jobs. <clears throat> they're an integral part of the economy and they're absolutely ineligible for any of the financial support that is going to, to other people who've lost their jobs. It is, it is a real serious inequity. It's, it's just sad because you know these folks are working every day. We're working every day and paying taxes and paying the rents and keeping our shops busy with you know with their consumer behavior and you know there is a lot of um, positive in all this and the ability of people to come here and make a living and that's kind of been shattered and I'm very worried about what happens when they lift the emergency and people start saying your rents do and. I want to see April's rent and I want to see May's rent if you haven't been working and how people are going to manage that is extraordinarily difficult. Right now, we've got about $5 million set aside for individual support. No doubt that is going to have to increase. And we are having a discussions with the governor's folks to see if there's any way that they can find a way to provide some income support for folks who aren't going to traditionally, who aren't going to qualify for traditional paths of unemployment. It is, um, it's a really challenging situation. If anybody read the Washington Post article this morning, it was flat out depressing story about Langley Park and what happens when a very large community is cut off from their ability to earn money. Um, we should all be thinking about that. And I've encouraged people to look for um, some of the nonprofits who, well, any of the nonprofits that do work in this community, but you know, I'd say particularly nonprofits who are looking to provide financial support for rent, food, and other things that these families need, 
um, do what you can to support them because um, we, we, really, we really need to do something. And uh, I've also asked that, you know, th this is a season of galas and Tom and I would have probably been doing a massive gala circuit right now, but there aren't any because of, because of the, um, the virus. And so a lot of the groups that, that have these events rely on these events as major parts of their fundraising. So if anybody out there listening to this um, has a history of going to these events, um, write them a check anyway. Uh, the chicken dinner wasn't worth all that much anyhow. <laughs> um, so if you can if you can think about who you supported last year, they need your support this year. They're not going to be able to wine you and dine you at a gala, but it doesn't change what they need. And I know you weren't giving the money because of the chicken dinners. You were giving the money because you cared about the, what the work these organizations do. And so I hope people can find it to continue to support those organizations. Um, in general, you know, we've been working um, with the council to make sure that we are um, addressing the targets and the issues that, that are front and center in the county. Uh, I just uh, talked to the Economic Development Corporation, asked them if they would uh, detail Brad Stewart to our procurement office. They have done that. And Brad, who has a background in biosciences and is deeply embedded in the industry, is going to work with our people to um, procure more, um, more items that we need. And the last thing I'll say is that one thing that is very clear from this, there's you know, obviously a good chance that this virus will bounce and we'll get a second dose of it. My instructions to procurement have been to buy everything you need for the next time now. We do not want to be doing last minute buying or guessing what we're going to need. We know what we need and uh, we can make a good approximation of what we're going to need going forward with all the shelters and um, caregivers are going to need. And so we're going to start laying in supplies now so that we've got the resources available. Um, that's, and, I, and hopefully everybody will be doing the same thing. And conceptually, the federal government might actually consider doing that because um, they sure missed the boat on this last go around. But I do want to thank, you know, Tom for putting this together. And um, you've been, you know, really a, a champion on the small business stuff. And I really appreciate your perspective, not just because it's pretty much similar to my perspective, but because I think we both know that uh, at the end of all this, we need businesses to open up again. I've done a lot of work on what happens next, including talking a lot with the governor's staff about what happens next, because this virus will end. And the real danger then will be that this economy um, continues to stay mired in a recession and that the recession feeds on itself and goes deeper. And so we need to make sure that everybody, including the state and federal government, are doing what they can to ensure that businesses can reopen as soon as they're given the opportunity to reopen. And I think for those folks, their biggest challenge is going to be, not unlike the tenants in the county, um, back rent. And I've talked to businesses who've been very blunt about it, that if, if somebody's expecting them to pay two months of lost rent, it's going to be a serious challenge for them to open their doors again. And we need to find a way out of it. I mean, the federal government could certainly help in this regard. Um, landlords could offer, you know, more than just forbearance, because if you tell people, I'll delay by a month to two months rent that you missed, um, that's not enough to get this done. So we need people that take a long view, not just of their own personal business interests, but of business in the county and what it means if we get mired in a recession that's steeper than this, it's going to be bad for everybody. And the collecting a rent may be the least of the problems of if this gets deeper than it is right now. So hopefully everybody will do their part. It is really good to see people working together and pulling together on this. Um, it, it certainly shows what we're capable of doing when we want to do something. And it would be nice if that becomes a lasting um, attribute that we really understand how much everybody depends on everybody else and how important everybody else is. Well, well-being is to our very own well-being. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Mark.
Great. Our uh, first question is from uh, Mike Meal. Hello. Yes. We can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yep. I guess. Thank you. I guess some of the questions, um, Mr. Ehrlich, you were an, um, answering, but I guess I'll just pose them again. Maybe what are some like, I guess, uh, concrete things we can do in our community, um, particularly like businesses. I know there's some uh, local breweries doing deliveries, but things that we could do um, to help the businesses. And then also um, our immigrants, the folks that are vulnerable, um, maybe can name some, uh, mention some um, specific agents, like um, maybe CASA, people we could help. Um, I don't know, I guess just trying to find a way to yeah. help in our limited capacity. So the yeah, first thing I'd say is go to the county website and uh, the first thing you get is the thing that says COVID-19 and there's a link. And when you get to the link, um, there's a wealth of information, including who to donate to. Um, so, you know, CASA is a good organization. There are a few organizations that work closely with the immigrant community. Catholic Charities is another one. There are all these homelessness groups that do work with the homeless people out there. Um, they all rely, you know, on donations. I know at least one of them had a big fundraiser that was that is not happening because of this, and that's gonna put a major hurt on their functioning. Um, so I would look for things like that and opportunities to give there. If you can go to a restaurant and, you know, get carry out, uh, if you can buy um, cards, you know, for future meals, um, certainly do that. If there are stores that if they don't have an, if they don't have an open door front, but if they have an online president presence and they're offering to sell gift certificates, um, buy the gift certificates. People need cash flow now because you know if you think about it, their rents and the utilities are coming due whether or not their doors are open, and. Uh, I, that's a small part of it. There are actually even volunteer opportunities. Again, you can find volunteer opportunities um, also on the website. So if, if you're interested, there are people who need your money, they need your energy, they could use some of your time. And uh, we're gonna, you know, we'll continue to help direct um, people who are interested to the organizations that need their support. Thank you, Mr. Executive. Uh, our next question is from Jennifer, and then we'll go to an update from Commander Frank. Um, thank you all for your tremendous public service at this really trying time. I have a question about people with disabilities who are having real trouble with uh, access to food, particularly people with pre-existing conditions that make them especially susceptible um, to the COVID virus. So um, the federal government has food stamps, but you can't use them online. Um, so County Executive Elrich, um, six states have been able to get a waiver from USDA so people can buy food um, with their food stamps online and have it delivered. And so I'm wondering if you can encourage Maryland to do the same, number one, and number two, the delivery fees, whether it's Instacart or, or Amazon or Walmart, if, if, if maybe there could be some help with the delivery feeds on that. And also for senior citizens are able to get Meals on Wheels, but that's not true for people who are not seniors right. and are people who are blind or quadriplegic, et cetera. So funny you should mention that because we were, I was on a conference call earlier today with uh, Laura Chardukian and she's working to get the state to allow SNAP benefits, other benefits to be um, paid for with a SNAP card without having to come in. I think you probably know, not everybody does, that if you were to, um, to, to have a credit card, you could purchase from any of these businesses online with a credit card. If you have a SNAP card, you have to come in in person. Um, and that may be a real challenge. So we're hoping that um, she can get the state. I'm gonna um, chime in on that as well because I think it's important that if other states have been able to do it, um, we should be able to do that as well. Uh, I know a little bit about disabled people. My, um, my son is, my foster son here has been um, without services. He's fortunate enough um, that we're home to take care of him. Um, but I think about the people who are, for example, independent living and often relied on a worker coming to help them and deal with some of their 
life um, challenges. And uh, if those folks aren't going out and doing that, um, then these, these people are very much on their own. And uh, I can follow up to see what contact our social services has had with some of the agencies that deliver services to people with disabilities. And we can certainly um, try to persuade um, the stores to waive the delivery fees for folks with disabilities. That would be a decent thing to do. Thank you very much. Great, and now we're going to uh, go over for an update from uh, Montgomery County uh, Police Commander Darren Frank. Good evening, council members. Good evening, uh, Mr. County Executive. Appreciate you guys having us uh, on. on I'll be quick because I know you have a lot of important people on the medical side and, and thank you to all of our, uh, our nurses, doctors, our medical workers, our fire rescue folks that are working so hard uh, at uh, helping people that are in great need, need to get better quicker. So thank you. Real quick, our uh, calls for services uh, last week, they kind of settled down. Uh, in the third district, we had 145 calls per day average. That's 35% down from what we normally have. Uh, notable decreases in that is uh, alarms, uh, assault calls, but I have a, ca a caveat that I need to discuss uh, about that. Our check the welfare calls are down a little bit. Some family members are, are more able to check on people and that was something we were concerned about. Our property damage collisions and our, uh, and our uh, personal injury collisions are also down 50. Uh, 50% and our traffic uh, calls, uh, complaints about uh, various traffic uh, hazards, trans uh, uh, interactions, those are down 60%. We do have some very notable increases though. Uh, we have got increases in domestic disputes. We've got that are, uh, we've got increases in domestic violence um, and, and we've got in increases in, in domestic violence with uh, juveniles involved, uh, fights between uh, kids and their, and their folks, kids and their caretakers. So 50% uh, increase in, in domestic disturbance calls, 46% increase in domestic violence. This is for the third district. Um, there's, there's numbers available for the whole uh, county as well. Um, Thanks, can so, you, uh, Commander, sorry, Tom. Thanks so much for being here, but could you, could you do, uh, not, not everybody uh, on the, the, the call and the feed is in the third district. Could you describe the boundaries generally? And, and is the same trend happening countywide? Thanks. Uh, so, our, so our boundaries uh, go uh, up a little bit, couple blocks uh, west of uh, Georgia Avenue, uh, goes up to about the Beltway, and then goes over and up uh, 29 all the way to, into Howard County uh, and uh, over to PG County and the DC line down below. Uh, across the entire county, we are seeing similar. Across uh, all the numbers I talk with, uh, these are specific to the third district, but again, our calls, calls for service remain down, but when I talk about the, the increases that we're seeing, domestic violence uh, is up, Burg uh, commercial burglaries are up, and auto thefts are up. And this is very similar to what they're seeing in, in New York City uh, that, uh, and, and they're a little bit ahead of us uh, in this process of, of dealing with COVID-19. So we're starting to see that now. If you remember last week, I said think, uh, uh, the actual crimes were uh, normal. Now we're seeing things peak. Uh, opportunistic uh, crimes that people are getting into. We, my uh, central business district team, and work, working very hard down in uh, our uh, Silver Spring Central Business Area. And they keep encountering individuals that uh, are wanting to take advantage of the situation that's going on. Um, the, when I talk about the domestic violence, our special victims investigators are working very hard to keep up with these. Um, again, you have people in their houses, they're not used to this much time together. The cold weather has played a factor. People can't get out and get exercise. Uh, and so we're, we're embarking on getting more information out to the public on things they can do to avoid this violence. I posted on Nextdoor last week some things from the Mayo Clinic about anger management, uh, taking a break, going and getting some exercise, thinking before you speak. Um, 
We also want to make sure that people know where they can go for help. Uh, the Montgomery County website has a number of different areas. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office has a, has a site that has a number of different resources. Uh, the number one that I wrote down there, Abuse, Ber Abuse Persons Program, phone number 240-777-4000, another resource for people. But first and foremost, if it's an emergency, if there's a fight, if you're being assaulted, call the police. We're going to come and we're going to get things calmed down and we're going to put you in touch with the right resources to get follow-up help. Um, the, uh, it's, again, we're, we're, we're very uh, concerned about this trend. Uh, we're concerned about the violence that's going with it, and and uh, really at a time of unity, we got to find a way to get past these these uh, domestic disputes and 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 uh, come out of this again stronger, uh, have, having spent some time together. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on real quick: auto thefts. Our delivery drivers out there, so they have an opportunity to support their small business, their medium business, their large business by making deliveries, but they're leaving their cars running. And they're leaving their cars running when they go to make a, a delivery. I, all all of our uh, folks that are on here that are listening, that are involved in in the restaurant business, that are involved in the delivery business, get with your drivers. Tell them turn your car off. Take the keys. Turn it off. It really takes two seconds to start a car. Uh, folks are that quick. They're jumping in and rolling away with the car. Uh, and and this is a very simple thing that we can put a stop to. Uh, other than that, our standard precautions about theft from autos, don't keep things of value in your car, don't keep that backpack in the back seat, uh, don't leave things in plain view, take them out because all our cars are sitting in parking lots now. Officers are, are, are rolling around. I will tell you, proud of the citizens, last week uh, my officers made three theft from auto arrests in the middle of the night. Citizens that couldn't sleep, they were up. Uh, spotted people, our officers were right there, made arrests after a couple foot pursuits. That's good stuff. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is, is stick with uh, see something, say something. If you see something suspicious in your neighborhood, you're there. You're kind of getting the feel for how things are. Give us a call. We are there for you. We're going to get to the we're going to get to the scene and potentially put people under arrest that are taking advantage of this of this uh, situation. The last thing, uh, one, of the, one of the folks have said uh, Nextdoor is a great resource. I'm trying to build that up in the third district. We're up to 26% of our residents on Nextdoor. We're posting uh, things more often there and all the districts are doing a great job. It's also in addition to the county website, which has, terrific, has a terrific COVID-19 page for, to guide you. Uh, Nextdoor is a way for us to touch base and for you to touch base with your neighbors and we're putting out information there. So. Everyone be well, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with everyone. Thanks so much, Commander. I appreciate it. Great. So while I'm pulling up our uh, pulling back up our presentation, I have a question for uh, Chair Albernaz. Uh, can you ask the governor to allow people with disabilities and seniors to use food stamps for online groceries or food delivery? Six states do this, but not Maryland. Yes, yeah, so I think the, uh, the county executive has been a strong advocate and his administration has been doing a terrific job um, advocating on behalf of our disability community. And to their credit, uh, Council, or, um, Dr. Raymond Crowell and Odile Brunetto from his team have formed a organizational structure similar to our food council to address the very unique and profound uh, needs of our disability community, which are also being disproportionately impacted by this virus. Everything from our group homes and ensuring that the staff there have PPE um, to uh, trying to make sure that as testing becomes available, that these organizations and these highly vulnerable individuals are in that first tier. Um, but we will, I think it's an excellent suggestion with regards to reaching out to the governor. And again, to the county executive's credit, he has been in constant communication with the governor and his team. And we will certainly run, up, run that up the food chain because I think it makes a lot, a lot of sense. Great. Uh, thank you, council member. Uh, next, we're going to start our Q&A on community resources for uh, vulnerable citizens. Uh, first, I'd like to ask uh, each of our uh, guests from service providers to introduce themselves and just uh, talk very briefly about some of the services uh, they're providing right now. Um, looking at the slide, we'll just start at the top with Jackie. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jackie DiCarlo from Mana Food Center. We um, really appreciate this opportunity, the leadership of uh, Council Member Hucker and all who have spoken in the various uh, aspects of coming together as a community. We also appreciate the community's support um, with uh, donations, offers of volunteering, and suggestions about how to um, continue the work that we're doing. Um, we also appreciate and want to acknowledge that um, the council members supported a special supplemental um, that would allow us to uh, re uh, uh, fit our approach. I'm sorry, I'm distracted by my cat coming into the screen. Sorry about that. A little entertainment. Um, I believe Dave has some slides or I can share my screen to help you all understand what we're trying to do to um, be responsive. We have been in the community for 37 years and I wanted to kind of echo and remind people what we're saying early on that we um, are able to, there we go, thank you. Um, we are able to uh, do what we do because of community support and a track record of delivering. These are unprecedented times, but we also have a great staff who are committed to taking our distribution sites, staying safe and still keep serving. Um, and we wanted to make sure that everyone had um, the best information about how, how to do that. So the, the process for our regular distribution is as it always has been, that people can call us at 301-434-1130. Uh, We're working every day to expand our call center's ability to respond to the increase in demand. But if you make an appointment, your household will be able to receive a three to five day supply of food in a prepackaged box. Um, we have also added as a response to COVID what we're calling stay put packs. And um, if you're eligible, you can receive a no contact home delivery and you'll be notified about eligibility during the time of scheduling. So our staff and volunteers are answering the phones when they get information from you of where you live, what your circumstances are, that is something that can be offered. So there was an earlier question about people with medical conditions or disabilities. We are um, giving top priority, for instance, to seniors. Um, we have a, a, a partnership with Lyft and um, some ride sharing is available also for seniors with those and others with limited transportation options. But hopefully um, you'll also be able to come to one of our distribution sites. We have one. Um, it, here in the district um, on uh, Tech Road and Old Columbia Pike. We're very proud to be a part of uh, this uh, district's community. And we also have other locations at Glenmont, United Methodist Church, Colesville Presbyterian Church, Silver Spring United Methodist Church. The faith communities have been really helpful to us. We also have a um, uh, opportunity for families to receive weekend bags. Um, we are working in close partnership with MCPS. And so um, on Fridays from 11 to one uh, at about nine different sites, these are bags that are designed to provide family size staples, canned vegetables, tuna, rice, pasta for the weekend for two <laughs> days, as well as some foods that kids themselves can prepare. Um, there are no IDs. So we've been talking a little bit about undocumented folks. Um, no registration is required in, in this case. Any Montgomery County family with a child 18 or under or has an MCPS student is eligible for those. So those are our, our two primary mechanisms for trying to uh, address the increase in food insecurity. We have seen a steady growth um, in the number of people turning to us. Uh, we are working to make sure that all of the resources of the food assistance organizations are brought to bear. So you've heard some reference of the Food Council. We're an active member of the Food Council. We have also helping to stand up a food security task force that the Office of Emergency Management is putting together. Um, and we're, we're also doing advocacy. Heard a little bit about SNAP. We're an active member in Montgomery Hunger, uh, I'm sorry, Maryland Hunger Solutions, which is working at the county, the state, and the national levels to make sure that policies are as, as supportive as possible. Um, so 
those are the kinds of things that we're we're doing and um, happy to answer any questions about um, uh, ways to access these resources or other ideas that people have and I, I do apologize that I wasn't able to um, to get this the screen shared but uh, it may be one of the slides that that Dave or Julio has okay thanks so much Jackie it's terrific to have you here uh, next I'll ask uh, David to introduce himself uh, if you have questions for Jackie or any of our panelists uh, please put them into the Q&A box or send us an email. Uh, we'll uh, try to answer all of your questions. We'll take as many questions live as we can. David? Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Dave. Um, I'm here as the CEO of the Jewish Council for the Aging, JCA, but also as a gerontologist. And this is a terrible time for older adults. Uh, they are no more likely, if healthy, to contract COVID-19 than their healthy younger counterparts. But of course, many older adults are not healthy. And of course, also many older adults uh, will have devastating results if they do in fact contract the disease. Uh, one of the things that is often invisible in Montgomery County and elsewhere as well is that the backbone of community service, the backbone of volunteerism, is often older adults. At JCA, we have over 1,300 volunteers. They're people of all faiths and from all walks of life doing all sorts of different things, but they're alike in a couple essential ways. First, many of them are, most of them, are age 60 and older. Many are in their 70s and 80s. So the people that used to deliver services are now finding themselves in extraordinary need of services. So a lot of what we're doing these days is to link the volunteers to one another and to community services because they're not accustomed to being the recipients of services, but that's the state that they're in these days. Um, if there's any message I would like to give to the many people on this Zoom and conference call is that there are far more resources available for older adults than you might think there are. Um, at JCA, we are serving people of all faiths from all walks of life, helping them to find rides, included as, including escorted rides. We're working with villages, community organizations, to help them expand services within their neighborhoods. We're working with the rec department and what a wonderful partner they are to deliver meals to older adults who used to attend senior centers. It was not easy to retool our buses so that the, instead of transporting older people, they are transporting meals to those older people who used to eat at the senior centers. But thank you to the county for being such a wonderful partner. Um, we're also continuing to run our Career Gateway program because we recognize that as soon as this pandemic is over, there is going to be an extraordinary need of older, for older job seekers to find work. And it is much harder for them, even in good days, for them to do that. Um, we are pilot testing a program that used to be very much face-to-face -face small groups and transforming that into a digital format. Um, we're working with people with, uh, who are in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Imagine, for those of us who are well, how depressing, demoralizing, scary it is to be isolated at home. Amplify that many times over for those with cognitive impairment and, frankly, for their elder caregivers as well. So we are preparing, we are working with a, a buddy program that is, uh, it has a variety of formats. Uh, we're talking with folks by telephone. We're providing videos. We are testing all sorts of new media that might carry forward even after this pandemic. And I think if there's one terrific thing that is happening in human services is we're learning all sorts of new ways to connect with people. Um, I guess the, the most important thing for me to share with you is whether it's questions about Medicare or questions about transportation or whatnot, I would encourage you to call the JCA Senior Helpline. Um, you can see our um, web address up there on the screen. 
um, when you go on our, to our website, just look up our, um, our resources. There are a lot of them. Or call us at 240-290-3311. That's 240-290-3311. We probably will not be able to take your call real time, but boy, we will get back to you just as quickly as possible. And that can be your central portal to all of the services that I've mentioned and, and many more. Great, uh, thank you so much, George. Hello, folks, um, and thanks so much for, for having me here. First, I just wanted to thank um, the great organizations that we we're, uh, are presenting here today. They're really key to uh, helping address the biggest needs right now in our community and as well um, to, our, to our leadership in the county who's been really um, at the forefront of helping us all um, figure this out and, uh, and, uh, and support us as much as possible. Um, so I, I think a lot of folks probably on this phone call are familiar with our organization, CASA. Um, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail into what traditionally we do. Um, but as an organization, as you can imagine, you know, we, uh, as you know, we provide everything from uh, English language uh, uh, assistance, uh, legal assistance, health assistance, um, a lot of workforce development and employment. And these are all things that we do um, in the undocumented community in a, in a very face-to-face -face fashion, right? Obviously these are all services, essential services when it comes to integrating into society that we work in a, in a group context or an individual face-to-face, -face. a lot of stuff that uh, we cannot provide at the moment. Um, so over the, over the past, um, you know, uh, uh, bits, uh, weeks that we've gone through this, um, we've, uh, we've, of course, adjusted to the, to our, to the situation, um, trying to provide as much assistance to our community in, um, in, by phone, um, virtually. Um, obviously, uh, you all know the situation. Everything is locked down, obviously, and even people that are suffering uh, legal um, a legal crisis and their immigration ca cases can't affirmatively move their cases through because the courts are, are closed. Um, so obviously it, it, it just exacerbates uh, the economic and the health uh, impacts. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've devoted a lot more resources to providing uh, more assistance on, uh, on our health and social services hotlines, a, a service that we have, we've already have more than 20 years of support um, by the county in establishing we provide this in, in French and Spanish and English and provide low income um, individuals navigational assistance to to uh, apply for benefits programs, um, find health resources. Obviously, it's it's a hotline that is uh, uh, ringing off the hook as, um, you know, the services and the demands have changed. Uh, we're navigating people through applying for unemployment benefits. We're navigating people um, to apply uh, uh, to ensure that they're getting um, uh, tested and following through with the COVID testing as recommended by their doctors. Of course, navigating some situations where they're actually be, even being charged um, uh, uh, for the COVID testing despite the, the governor's mandate. Um, so uh, providing a lot of crucial information and navigational assistance telephonically as much as we can. Um, and also, you know, a big component of what we do is employment um, and, and workforce development. There are still Every morning at six o'clock in the morning, we still develop rosters of folks that are available for work. Um, and there's still uh, jobs and opportunities out there for folks that we're trying our best to, to, uh, uh, to match employers to, our, our, um, to workers. Um, and it's really at this time of so much economic need, those, those opportunities are, are really essential. Um, so we are doing our best to provide um, the workers or PPE equipment, masks, um, and gloves to a large extent to help them um, be safe, um, not only themselves, but also protecting their, their employers while on the job. Um, and, and a lot of folks are, are still hiring for them, right? Uh, uh, for essential things such as maintenance, such as uh, cleanup and other kind of, uh, of situations. So um, if, if you have even a home improvement uh, uh, situation going on in your house, I still encourage you to come to go through us. We're still doing our our enrollment, our, um, our roster of, of workers on a daily basis and matching them to work opportunities. So I still encourage you to go 
um, through our, our website, through our main phone number, and it's, you can uh, reach it through our website that you can see on your screen um, to, to ask for uh, and, and request workers. If you have any kind of landscaping needs, construction needs, maintenance, cleaning needs, these are all essential to help our, our, our community withstand the economic impact um, of what's going on right now. Also, you know, we're doing our best also to, to, to help people during this time, uh, even continue to learn English. We're still providing some classes virtually. Um, and so people are still receiving, uh, uh, um, receiving that service. In addition, thanks to, to the McHale program as well, who's a big supporter of that program. Um, but other areas that we've expanded and, and trying to innovate to try to help our community uh, survive through this crisis is a couple George, of different areas. George, hey, it's Tom. I'm sorry, I just, I, we're over at past eight o'clock. I just wanna make sure everybody else gets a chance to speak and ask their questions to the county executive and the chair of the HHS committee. I know we have with us Ann Mazur, the CEO of Every Mind and Meredith Peace from the Montgomery County Crisis Center and Joe Fredoni of the, the deputy director of the Arts and Humanities Council. We're really grateful for everything you're doing um, to help people during this crisis. Um, Dave, do you have some more questions? I know there's a long queue of people trying to get to the, especially the county executive and the HHS chair. Uh, yeah, so our uh, first question, um, next question is from Nolu. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. First of all, I wanted to say thank you to our very own council member Hucker for his leadership and the county executive. It's times like this that I'm just so proud of Montgomery County and so glad that I live here because, you know, people, we get it. It's not just about us, but it's for the least of these. So my question is, are store workers going to be required to wear these face coverings? Um, I understand that the customers, we the customers, and I am a senior, I live in an independent senior building, the sanctuary on University Boulevard East. So my question is about store workers. Are they going to be required to wear face coverings as well as bus drivers and others who could uh, potentially be asymptomatic? Uh, the order says yes. Okay, great. Um, we're, we're very clear because this is about protecting both people, both um, protecting you, but also protecting them. And this only works if everybody who's in contact or close proximity is wearing masks. And that's what we've Excellent. asked for. Excellent, thank you so much. Great, our next question is from Rachel Evans. Uh, Rachel, you can unmute when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I, it was for, for Jackie about mana food. Um, what do you need most of? Financial donations, um, volunteers, something else? And I guess it could be to any of the, um, but I'll start with Jackie. I'm from Vanna because I live in White Oak. Um, and especially in the harder hit areas, what, what do you need from the community to support you? Thank you so much for wanting to help out. I mean, we certainly need uh, volunteers because we, um, as we increase our services, we always rely on volunteer uh, help. But as you pointed out, donations of um, financial donations are, are critical as well. In this particular time, um, we now more than ever need to purchase exactly what we need. We need to make those purchases both of food, but also of the personal protective equipment that we've heard referenced a lot. And there have been some supply chain issues. So there's been generous support um, in the community for donations that make that possible. And if you visit manafood.org, which is on, on the screen, um, but backslash COVID response, you can see some of the um, ways that we've been responding. And there's also a, a place to sign up to volunteer either in one of our facilities or as a food runner. So thank you for the question. Those are two key ways that people can help. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Good question. Our, our next question um, perhaps for Anne, how can people who are uninsured receive mental health care services? Uh, good evening, everyone. Anne Mazer with Every Mind. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, we do mental health and wellness across the lifespan. So for um, uninsured, we do have a partnership if it's a youth or a family that are within the MCPS school system. There's a partnership between Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Every Mind, and a couple other nonprofits in the community and MCPS. 
through the Linkages to Learning program and also uh, the school and community youth services programs. So if you are in schools that have that programming, uh, that programming for mental health support as well as social service support through case management is still 100% running. If um, you do are not, um, you know, don't have a youth in MCPS or at one of those um, linkages to learning or school and community based services schools, you can reach out to us on um, our um, hotline. Our hotline is a crisis line, but it is also supportive listening and resource and referral. That number is 301-738-2255. And a, a call counselor on, on the line can help you find a provider that can provide um, either if you're uninsured, Medicaid eligible, or if you do have insurance, uh, find someone that takes your insurance. Great. Our next question will be from Mark Green. Um, we had a question from Ruthie. We've been encouraging residents to think of this as physical distancing, not social distancing. How are your nonprofits working to keep spirits up and what other mental health support is available? Uh, first and foremost, at this time, I would um, say that we are recommending everyone to take a few man moments for self-care. Uh, if you do go to our website, we actually have a webinar that is recorded uh, about some tips for self-care but first and foremost, it's, you know, that analogy of putting the face mask on yourself first. It's the same for mental health and wellness. Uh, so uh, take, take breaks during the day. Um, set schedules. Try to uh, set maybe only one or two goals for the day and work on just those one or two goals. Um, talk with members of your family. Take time, everyone individually to take some time to do what you need to do for self-care, whether it's taking a walk around the neighborhood, um, doing an online yoga class, be sure to stay in contact with your friends and family, just like we're doing with this town hall meeting tonight through Zoom or other methods like that. It's really critical and really important. Um, if you find that you do need additional support, you absolutely should uh, reach out to our hotline or, or similar services if, if you need to. Great. Our next question is from, uh, I believe, Ms. Green. Hello. Um, I'm wondering, uh, someone was speak. first of all, thank you very much for this call. Um, uh, someone was speaking earlier about the folks who will, will not be eligible for the federal economic impact payments um, because of their immigration status uh, and that there are uh, there's county funding available for emergency funding for some of those folks. And I was wondering what are the um, mechanisms that you will use to get that the word out to uh, those individuals who will be eligible so that they are aware of it? Um, we're going to be working with our provider community. Um, there, there are advantages about using the provider community um, rather than having the government um, be the source of putting the funding out. And I think some people understand what those are. Um, so so um, we're going to make sure that people who are connected and doing work in that community or those communities um, are front and center in terms of being able to get the money out to those communities. That seems like the simplest, most direct way for us to do it. And we don't have to invent something that we may not have developed very well ourselves. I mean, we, we've always relied on nonprofits um, to provide services in the community. This is not gonna be anything different. Thank you. Gabe, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I would just add very quickly, um, in addition to what the county executive just said, the Department of Health and Human Services is working with a lot of key stakeholders, including our faith-based community, uh, to make sure that we conduct outreach and really hitting the families who have disconnected from government services. And we're also going to be working with some of those connectors within communities, those trusted individuals and leaders that are out there, um, in addition to our faith-based community, to make sure that we get the word out 
and that as many people as possible have access to these funds. Thank Great, you. I'll take a written question and then, um, and then Avi, Steve, and Jenaline. Uh, so the question is, are there still social programs that residents can access online? Joe, do you want to talk? Um, sure. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Frandoni. I'm the Deputy Director at the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County. Um, and to address that question specifically, yeah, I think that um, a huge resource for that is our culturespotmc.com website. So that's our um, online cultural calendar and magazine uh, that posts content generally about events happening around the county and opportunities to engage uh, in your community as well as with, uh, through the arts and humanities. Um, but currently we've converted it to online and virtual events, classes, camps, um, resources, videos, uh, as a way for people to stay socially active and socially engaged through the arts and humanities. So I'd recommend that. Uh, and it also has a directory of organizations. So if you're looking for something specific, um, there are organizations like Arts for the Aging that are on there, um, offering program for seniors, you know, art stream for people who are living with disabilities, Create Art Center that does great work with art therapy. So it's a good resource for kind of engaging locally with what organizations are around that offer kind of social as well as services um, through the arts and humanities. Great, thanks, Joe. Our next question, Avi, if you could unmute yourself. We'll come back to you, Avi. Uh, Steve, you're unmuted. Did you want to ask your question? Yes, it, it's uh, it's already been asked, I think. Great. Well, what can the county or county residents do for the undocumented during this difficult time? I think I tried to address that. I mean, I think yeah, I'll, go, I'll go back to give to those organizations which um, traditionally have helped the undocumented, uh, volunteer for organizations which have traditionally helped the undocumented, um, write the governor and just make a nice compassionate plea for additional state support um, aimed, aimed to, to help the undocumented. They, they actually provided us a very long list of programs which anybody, meaning anybody, can access. And so we've taken that and we're in the process. I don't know if it got posted today or if they're working on posting it up today, um, but they were gonna um, provide all the information, all the state programs that can help people. And there are a lot of state programs that do not require um, or are not contingent on immigration status. Um, the big question is none of them really have the capacity to replace the incomes at the level they need to be replaced. And so the important thing would be to see what we can do to get um, get the governor to look at ways of providing direct funding for some of us. Great, and George, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, real, real quick, and this is something I forgot to mention and I didn't get a chance to mention in the presentation. So at CASA itself, we, we have created what we call a solidarity fund. Uh, so I provided a link there on the chat. It's also can be reached on our website. Um, the point of the Solidarity Fund is that uh, it's, it's their, uh, we're raising funds from individual donors, like people on this phone call, to distribute, to distribute directly to, uh, uh, to individuals, uh, specifically undocumented individuals, that are not going to receive and not eligible to receive anything uh, that the federal government right now has approved through the CARES Act. So right now we have a list of 400 families that we're going to be um, uh, uh, supporting directly that we've already been in contact previously. We've raised uh, nearly $100,000 that, that gives us enough for that initial priority uh, list of folks that we have right now. Uh, but of course the need is, is vast. Um, this is an, in complement to what the county is doing as well. Um, but this is meant to go directly to individuals like day laborers, uh, documented families, um, with multiple jobs. I mean, those specific families that 
you read about in the in the Langley Park um, Washington Post article today. So appreciate your support, um, and you can find the link on the chat and also on our website. Great. And our next question is from Laura Wallace. Um, earlier on the call, uh, Councilmember Alvarez um, let us know of the five million dollars that's um, for direct aid to residents. How much is going through Health and Human Services, um, and how much is going through um, providers directly? And I just didn't catch the exact breakdown. And um, I think that's something that people would really love to know if um, a council member or someone else could reiterate that those numbers. Thank you, Laura. Yes, it's 3.5 will be administered through the Department of Health and Human Services and 1.5 will go through community based organizations. Great, thank you. Uh, we've received uh, many uh, questions throughout the past few weeks uh, concerned about a rise in uh, domestic violence. Um, could um, could we just talk about uh, services related to that? I can start and then I'm sure others will chime in. Um, so one of the nonprofit organizations that is specifically designed to assess, assist victims of domestic violence is, is the Family Justice Center, um, which has had to significantly expand its services and accepting donations uh, for families who are absolutely in crisis. Uh, they also serve the children who are the victims of domestic violence. And um, they, there was an article even before COVID-19 that they, they were down on their supply of toys and in particular stuffed animals. Um, and so they're like so many other organizations continuing to accept donations during this time to be able to, to, to provide some comfort and some support uh, for these families who are in desperate need. Um, and I know a number of our providers, specifically in the mental health space, are also working to provide additional support. And as you heard from an update within law enforcement, uh, we're trying to step up our support. I don't know if you saw, just as a side note, there was this story, um, there was a reporter from the BBC who wrote on her hand the phone number of the domestic violence number in that particular community in England. And the, the, number, the calls went up over 30%. So it's, it's and, and that's of course in another country, but it is a huge issue. And I'm also, I'll be quite candid, terrified that there's been a record sale of alcohol um, as, as we've seen through all of this. And so you have this perfect negative storm coming together all at once. And so um, I, I uh, call upon all of us to reach out and volunteer and provide support for our neighbors who are particularly in need and really in crisis right now and refer those services that you heard from every mind earlier, um, but to also call 911 in instances where we suspect something terrible has happened. And, and Dave, this is Anne. If I could just add to Gabe's point, uh, I'm not sure that I specifically said that the number that I gave, the 301-738-2255, you can also text to that number and our counselors can connect that person to organizations that specifically are working with uh, domestic violence. But oftentimes we find that the option to text is a much safer um, avenue versus a telephone call. So that's something also that someone can reach out and we can connect them directly to organizations that are working in the, uh, with domestic violence. I, I just want to add to that. Um, we met with um, the moms group and uh, we're, we are um, going to put out some public interest um, advertisements about domestic violence and about just generally and mental health related issues. I do want to say about the alcohol, here's the irony of, of um, what Gabe said. Um, one reason that the alcohol sales are continuing is because people are very afraid of what happens when alcoholics can't get alcohol. And the going through the withdrawal and the uh, the effects that that can have on 
um, families and what happens. And this one hospital person said to me, the last thing I want to do is have to use my precious hospital beds to detox an alcoholic. Uh, so it's a very, um, it was a very interesting and, and mixed kind of situation, but uh, there is certainly a danger in having alcoholics not have access to alcohol that puts their families in danger as they start to detox. So there was a reason behind um, getting to that point, and that's sort of the reason that was behind it. Thank you. And I know some of these questions have been uh, very relevant to the Montgomery County Crisis Center. Um, and uh, uh, Meredith, if you could shed some light on, uh, on these topics and the other services you provide. Okay, uh, fortunately, uh, my manager's on here tonight, Dorna Hill, so she may wanna chime in as well. But the Crisis Center is open 24 seven for walk-ins and telephone. Our mobile crisis calls are suspended at this time and our crisis beds are suspended at this time. Um, we have our psychiatrists that are doing telemedicine right now. They're uh, just in the beginning stages of it, but they're uh, learning and beginning to see patients that way as well as walking clients. Dornay, did you wanna add something? Sure. Hello, everybody. So we are open 24-7. We do mental health assessments uh, across the lifespan, homeless assessments, and domestic violence services. We see clients, get them to shelter. We provide transportation to get them to the crisis center. And we're able to help um, link them to therapy, group services, and things like that. Um, Every mind and I work very closely together. Um, we also take calls 24 seven. Every mind passes off calls to us and we pass off calls to them. So thank you, Anne, for that great partnership. Um, but like, like Meredith stated, we are not taking, um, we're not doing mobile crisis in the community, but we are providing services at our center. Um, face-to-face -face for therapists, and also we have telemedicine for psychiatry. We don't take insurance. We're open to anyone who is a member of Montgomery County community. Come on in and see us. Please call us, refer people, and we get you to the right place where you need to be. Um, so there's been a misconception out there that we are um, closed, but we are not closed. Right. We are still there and ready to serve. Mm -hmm. And we have seen a great increase in um, domestic violence cases. Right. Um, the majority of our clients have been domestic violence cases right now. Um, and like I said, we do have, as um, Mr. Alvin has said, we do have the link to therapy for the children, therapy for the, for the offenders and for, sorry, don't know what happened. Sorry, uh, we have services for the offender and for the abused person. Um, and we work very close with the abused persons program and also um, VASAP, the victim assistance program for sexual assault and um, violence as well. So if you have a question, you can always call us. We are open 24 seven and we can get you where you need to be. We've been seeing also an increase in calls for co consumers looking for food assistance, um, support um, if they're not eligible for services. And I'm also a part of the food storage task force. So there will be some more information coming forth about that, about people in the community who are unable to get to mana food or get to um, services and how we can get them what they need. So if you have a question, just call us at 240-777-4000 and we're there to help you. Yeah. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much. And this is Ann uh, Dornay and Meredith. Thank you um, again for the partnership as well. I just wanted to point out that the Crisis Center for non-English speaking individuals in our community, the Crisis Center is definitely the first call to make. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, at Every Mind, we do not have capacity for non-English speaking individuals. So I just wanted to point that out also for the community um, that the Crisis Center absolutely should be the first call for non-English. And we do not charge a service. Like I said, we don't take insurance. There's no fee. We're free of, so we're free of charge. Right. All Great. right. Our next questions will be from uh, Jenaline 
Tracy, Sean, and then uh, Eric uh, separately. Uh, Alan Norman asked that each panelist um, type in uh, the number to the various telephone numbers um, that have been mentioned. So, Jenilyn, you can unmute. Hi, good evening. How are you guys? Um, well, one of my questions, actually, I have several different issues because um, we had a meeting la um, yesterday, um, last week, Thursday, with the group of um, leaders in healthcare, um, my healthcare community network, and assisted living, and also senior community network. So one of the um, one of the issues that we're uh, we're getting a lot right now is that the hospital are being um, are transferring all of their uh, COVID-19 patients to all to the skilled nursing facilities. We don't have uh, enough um, PPE um, equipment. Too, we are as, as also need of um, a kind of um, professional or med, uh, clinical. Um, demonstration for our staff how to properly use PPE, even though we really, we already uh, uh, teach them how to do that, but still some sort of video that we can send our staff uh, on a portal that they can play that and how they can properly use and dispose PPE. Um, signage to all of the skilled nursing facilities, how to properly use and dispose PPE. And then for the uh, villages, because um, I, I uh, talked to several different uh, villages um, of Montgomery County. There are growing concern of some of the seniors that they, do, they still don't have enough groceries, transportation, or to pick up their medicine, and also growing issues of mental um, issues due to uh, depression because they don't have family, they live on their own, so they don't have um, access to the... Um, to technology and also some of them they don't have internet so we're trying to go to a um, public television to constantly provide resources so see if they can post those resources for the seniors that don't have internet or not skilled to go to a web so they can actually watch um, uh, still photos of information that they can call or access. Sure, so those are some great questions and hopefully we've answered some of those throughout the presentation, but um, uh, panelists, uh, does anyone want to start? I'll just say, I don't know of the hospitals moving COVID-19 patients to nursing homes unless they're on the recovery side of it rather than the, the need to treat them side of it. I mean, the, the hospitals are trying to preserve the beds inside the hospitals for COVID-19 patients who need the medical care. Um, they've looked at nursing homes for both taking patients who are not acute, who are in the hospital but don't, rely, don't re require um, intensive care or intensive supervision. That's what I've been told the hospitals are looking at nursing, home, nursing homes for. Um, rather than uh, than for their prime uh, COVID nineteen patients, they those patients need to be actually in the hospital. Great, thank you, Mark. And I see some of our panelists are also sending um, some other uh, comments uh, to all panelists and attendees through the chat. Um, we are about to wrap up, so I'm just going to take two more questions. Uh, Tracy, if you're still there, I'm still here. I'm, still here. I'm Tracy I'm Matthias. And my question is, how should residents handle interactions with the police, for example, traffic stops, during the period when we should wear masks while interacting with essential employees? So, Frank, I can. I'm sorry. Avoid a traffic no. stop. <laughs> There's a the thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, I think I was about to say exactly what you were going to say, which is keep the mask on. If there's yeah. an investigative need where an officer needs to confirm an identity on a driver's license or something of that nature, they'll ask you to remove it. But we want to keep you safe. Again, uh, someone said asymptomatic earlier. An officer could be asymptomatic, and we don't want to we don't want to infect you. They, so uh, wear your mask. Uh, 
let's have great respectful uh, interactions and, and we'll work together to get through these unique challenges uh, that, that we're facing. But, but wear that mask. And uh, again, the officer might ask you to remove it just to do an investigative piece, but uh, uh, that should get resolved quickly. I also believe that, you know, we've had this conversation with the police department about focusing with it, what policing they do on a real need to stop somebody. In other words, if somebody's going five or 10 miles over the limit, maybe 45 and a 35 or something like that, maybe that's not a stop you need to make. If somebody's weaving and can't keep a car in a lane or otherwise driving recklessly, that's a stop you probably need to make. So they're using some discretion about when they pull people over. But um, the easiest way always to avoid getting pulled over is not to do what you got pulled over for. Great. And then uh, final question, just um, uh, if any panelists could recap any uh, transportation services uh, that are available for um, the elderly and uh, vulnerable residents. This is David Gamzee, and uh, certainly I, I want to underscore that um, a call to the JCA Connect a Ride program or our senior helpline could open up a variety of options for older adults as well as adults of any age with uh, disabilities. So, uh, you know, it's not an easy um, one size fits all answer. Um, certainly, sadly, those with more financial resources have more options than those who don't. Um, but yet there are many options for everyone. And so I, I, again, would encourage you to call our senior helpline. I did post on the chat function uh, both the email address and the phone number of that helpline. And uh, since it was requested that, that I recap, so if uh, anyone calls 301-424-1130, our call center staff will work to figure out what is the best solution. Uh, as David just said, there's so many different um, scenarios. Um, we are lucky to have strong partnerships with Senior Connection, with villages of, of different neighborhoods like Villages of Kensington. Um, so we try to match what our partnerships are with what the needs are. And we do have um, ride sharing options for those who have Lyft um, app on their phones, and we even coach seniors to use that um, so we can uh, get lift rides for seniors. So um, our 301-424-1130. Thanks, Jackie. And I'll just add, um, a lot of folks know this, but both, it was in the media, but uh, Capital Bike Share and Lyft are both offering free rides to essential workers. Um, so folks should take advantage of that, and you can access that through the DOT website or just call our office. Great. And any uh, closing comments, uh, Councilor Hucker? Thanks, Dave. Thanks uh, to you and Julio, Dave, uh, for putting this together. This is a lot of work. Uh, I've been on a lot of Zoom calls that don't go off uh, so seamlessly. So um, I know with, with uh, the large audience that we have, this is a lot of work and appreciate uh, everything that you're doing. And I want to thank the County Executive for being on and, and uh, um, uh, the Council uh, HHS Chair Gabe Albernaz, uh, my colleague and friend. Uh, I didn't expect you both to stay on for so long, but I really appreciate it. I know our, our listeners and viewers do as well. Um, and thanks so much, uh, Commander Frank, uh, who's been on three calls in a row now, um, and our Deputy Health Officer, Dr. Bridgers, thank you so much, as well as Jackie and David and George and Ann and Dornay and Mer Meredith from the Crisis Center and Joe. Um, I know all, all of our listeners and viewers benefited from your wisdom tonight. We're really grateful for your participation, hanging in there. Um, with us. Thanks to everybody who joined us for our virtual town hall. I want to reiterate that the county government is working seven days a week and here for you. And if there's individual services that you need, get in touch with our office, which is 240-777-7960. Feel free to call 311 as usual or email me at tom.hucker at montgomerycountymd.gov. Um, and we'll be here next Monday night at 7 p.m. for a follow-up discussion feel free to RSVP at tomhucker.com slash COVID. Thank you all again. Uh, stay safe, stay home, and stay connected to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you.